Cool, lovely. Thank you, Elliot. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Bryony Hope Green and I am the content manager at British Esports. So today I am joined with Billy Purdy, Freeman Williams and Abby Reynolds. So if you guys can just do a little introduction, tell people what you do. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Billy Purdy. I am the Women in Esports Manager at British Esports. Um, essentially, I work on the Women in Esports Initiative um, alongside the Women in Esports Committee. Um, essentially, what we try and do is promote inclusivity and diversity within esports um, through our four pillars. Um, so, yeah. Um, I am, I'm Freeman, or free, I'll go Freeman do on, online. That's like my like, gamer tag. Um, I work at Excel, I'm a talent manager. Uh, I actually started there as like, uh, like doing content, doing like video stuff. Um, moved on to like a Fortnite managerial role with our, with our two Fortnite players. And then, um, and then talent as of this year. So if you guys are into League, we have, uh, we have Cajrel, so he's one of our content creators. We have um, Wolfies, with some of you guys into, into Fortnite. And we have some like variety and, and mobile gamers as well. So quite like diverse across the, across the board. Um, hello everyone, my name's Abby. I'm from The Knoll. Um, we do collegiate at university level competition and I specifically work um, in the community so I look after our um, student representatives across the UK. I'm from a university background so I was an elected, elected officer at Loughborough University um, for two years during the pandemic and looked after societies there so did a lot of like training, advocation, representation for students and student problems um, and I've done university work in student services and things as well. So. Um, Predominantly university background, um, but I've always had gaming kind of in my sights. Um, I did a lot of volunteering in gaming communities at my uni as well. So, Awesome, thank you. So today this panel is about accessibility into esports. So esports is actually one of the most sort of inclusive and diverse industries in the world, I would say. So I've sort of coined this term, esports is for all. Um, and I really like sort of standing by that and I think a lot of people within the community also stand by that. So essentially, it may not seem like it sometimes for some people, but esports is open enough to anyone from any sort of race, age, gender, sexuality, regardless of ability or disability, socioeconomic backgrounds. Esports is readily available for anyone to get involved in. So these lovely people also have some stories to tell and some things to say about how accessible esports can be for anyone from any background. So initially to start, I think I'll ask you guys individually, what sort of barriers have you faced yourself getting into esports? I'll start with you, Billy. Uh, yeah, so I would say getting into esports, it's not, I've not really had so many barriers, I would say. I think it's actually been a relatively easy industry to actually break into. Um, previously I worked in hospitality and retail and so I would say then my age was kind of a limiting factor in my career progression in the sense that if I was a manager and I had older people to manage there was always that sort of stigma and that sort of difference in attitude of having a younger person manage you. Whereas in esports I feel like, I mean you could be a pro player from the age of 16 which is really, really young. So being a manager in esports, it's totally different in the sense that your age isn't necessarily a barrier or even a fact that you'd consider as, can I get into this? Can I not get into it? Like it's so accessible to all, no matter how old you are, I would say. Yeah, so I think, and I'll probably refer back to, to like the Fortnite scene, because that's what I'm used to. That was like my introduction into, into esports. Um, and I think generally as a whole, I, I feel like I feel like everyone that is in the scene is is all, we're all in this like discovery phase of like oh this is this cool thing, this is esports, it's new, it's fun, it's a competitive side to gaming. Um, and even I was talking to some of my colleagues uh, last week with um, about like the competitiveness because XL were based quite near to Fnatic, we're, we're really close to Guild, we're all within like 10, 15 minutes of each other. And um, I think we'll talk about our HQ party and that we, we had invited them along. We had invited their workers along, like some of their players. And I feel like sometimes you don't really see that in traditional sports because, you know, like the rivalry between Arsenal and Spurs is like, you know, do or die. You know, if, if you're caught wearing a, you know, a Spurs top as an Arsenal fan, you're, you're going to be, you know, you're not, you're not going to be part of that fan base anymore. But I feel with esports, we're definitely in that phase where 
everyone is kind of, we all want it to grow, we all want it to become like something bigger. Um, you know, and developing like those like serious rivalries at this point is probably not beneficial at all. So yeah, I, I think that togetherness makes it like really, you know, inclusive and gets everyone uh, on board. So yeah, I found the whole process easy to, to get into it. Um, I think sharing the sentiment of what you both said here is like once I got to the point of wanting to go into the industry, I think I found it quite uh, easy to get into. But I, I think maybe the barriers were a little bit earlier on today and it's been amazing today to see some of the resources and facilities that are available to the younger generation now because I think that's perhaps where I faced some barriers. Um, definitely like was the free school meal uniform council house um, student who perhaps didn't have you know all the latest technology and could keep up um, with everyone else or the latest trends so um, I was fortunate enough to get like maintenance allowance and that's what funded uh, my interest in gaming back in the day paying for my RuneScape membership um, so yeah that was uh, definitely a barrier earlier on um, and then once you hit university I think it's that um, what we spoke about today is like finding that community and having that um, environment to build confidence and build skills that you perhaps don't get afforded to you um, from a working class background. Um, and definitely faced uh, barriers in my health as well, um, especially at university again. Um, so it's, yeah, perhaps not from the industry itself, but earlier on, um, like working to, you know, get those uh, life skills that you perhaps aren't afforded when you're earlier on um, and find those communities that you feel safe in. Um, but I think one thing that we perhaps do take for granted is the, the journey into esports, perhaps for my generation at least, um, did require a lot of voluntary work and a lot of free time, which is definitely something that a lot of people can't afford to do um, if you're needing to work, or you perhaps don't have the energy to work outside of your academic studies. So I think that's perhaps something that's still a problem today is that we do rely on these um, you know, uh, volunteer uh, roles to get the experience that we need to kind of break into the industry. Um, so again, it's amazing to see the work that's being done to make that a part of academia earlier on um, and seeing like things like confetti students take part in broadcasts and stuff that they would have perhaps have to have done uh, free beforehand and now be a part of their studies. So yeah, it's definitely awesome to see how things are growing and uh, improving. Yeah, definitely. And the industry has also like opened up a variety of different opportunities for people from all sorts of backgrounds. Like we, I don't want to take over with promos for British esports. Um, but we recently um, have sort of done a pilot with Xbox and National Star as a way to sort of get more people with disabilities who may not have been given the opportunity to compete in esports or play esports to have that chance and to be in that setting where they can both enjoy themselves, learn a new experience and just have fun really. So I think Esports is great at providing these opportunities and it is like very accessible to people and it's a really good thing what you guys have all have said. So I think I'll start off with Billy um, talking about women in esports and the initiative. So why do you believe initiatives like women in esports are important for the industry for it to remain accessible? Um, I think initiatives are important first of all in the sense that they're not competing with one another, not, one's not trying to outdo the other. It's all about obviously growing the industry together. So women in esports is something that we want to ensure that we're working alongside these other initiatives such as women in games, any key. You know, there's so many out there now because of the rate that the industry is growing. Um, so a couple of the things that women in esports are focusing on this year are our four pillars, obviously we've got, um, they're just there, but we have community, we have education, we have safer space and we have competition. And really pinning down different goals that we have for each of these pillars is our sort of focus because we believe that they're sort of the areas that we need to improve on to make the esports industry more inclusive and more accessible. So whether that be for competition, for example, we're wanting to put on more tournaments this year for women and marginalised genders so that they still have that same opportunity to compete at that high level because it, it's not that women aren't competing in these tournaments or in this industry, it's more so that 
they don't have the same opportunities to grow and to get to that high level. And that's perhaps due to a lack of resources or a lack of opportunity because obviously we're not for profit. So being able to put on these tournaments, you have a various factor of where do we get that prize pool from? And so as long as the prize pools are, as long as the prize pools obviously, sorry, <laughs> um, the prize pools, it's, it's more like the, the amount of the prize pools is what I'm trying to say. Kind of, it, it makes tournaments more difficult and less accessible because obviously you've got things like game changers which are putting in lots of money to these sort of initiatives. Whereas with women in esports, it's like how, how do we get there? without sponsorship money. So I think just things like tournaments and prize pools and things like that is already limiting us in moving forward and moving in the right direction. Um, but obviously it's, it's something that's really important, I feel like. Definitely. So um, I'll swiftly move on to that. Um, so Freeman, um, do you, with your experience in sort of like with Excel and being uh, the more professional sort of level of esports and having that sort of insight. Do you feel that the pro scene is accessible to minority groups as other areas of the industry? Um, I, f I think it's like, it depends on the game sometimes and you know, where you are in the world, you know, uh, can you, you know, go to Kari's and get your PC and get your bits and, and get play in? There's, there's a lot of different factors into it, but I said uh, about Fortnite, that's, that's one that I'm quite familiar with. Um, if you don't know the competitive structure of Fortnite, it's, it's open. So, if any of you guys wanted to go home now and you know go and play one of the cups and like play one of like the official tournaments, you can. Um, there's no like there's no gatekeepers. There's no one stopping you doing that. You you can go and do it, which is like a is a great thing, right? That you can you can go home. You can get involved straight into this community and do really well. So there's been uh, I'll say like the back end of like last year, I'm still somewhat involved in the scene. Um, you've had like two or three players out of nowhere who've never earned like anything from the game, just win like a hundred grand, get signed to a pro team, and then they're now a professional player. Um, and that's hard. Like that's hard to do in in what in, in sports or anything like that. I, I know if it's maybe it's football. I've, I've got quite a long background in as well. Um, you, you need to get scouted. You need to know the right people. Uh, you need to be have have money to travel to to these events and and do all these things. But with certain esports, you can literally just log on, practice for a year, get really good, network a little bit, find the right people to play with, and then you know, before you know, you're you're in you know a competitive scene and you're making money for it, and, and you're fully uh, involved with it. Um, and I think maybe from like my own like personal experience, um, of uh, maybe more of like a privileged, not privileged background, but compared to other people like. Especially moving to London now and seeing some of the areas that are like, I guess, like more rundown and there's less like money funneled into it, um, and seeing because I grew up in Portsmouth, like stable households, um, I was able to buy my own PC when when I was 20 and and start that. Um, I haven't had like many issues getting involved in the scene, whether that's through like content or through competition. I've, I've just been able to start. But then you know I've had uh, schools reach out to me since I've been in London who are starting like these. The like esports after clubs and they're trying to build up the grassroots scene of it, but it's super hard for these kids that they they can easily like log on and, and watch it, and Twitch and whatever. But you know you've got that and then you've got again buying a whole PC rig and because you want to get into esports you you can you can do console but then you're limiting what esports you're getting into. So maybe it's FIFA or like a little bit of Fortnite. But if you really want to get into it, it has to be like PC and you eventually want you know like a, a solid rig where you can actually compete and and do part. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot of factors, but personally, I found it like quite easy and, and smooth to, to get into, which has been nice. Awesome. And so like the segue from sort of professional to collegiate level, really, there's um, in, on paper, there's quite a significant difference between the two. But Abby, do you, same sort of question I asked Freeman, do you feel as though the collegiate level of esports is accessible enough? I think um, yes and no. I think there's areas um, to improve on, and there's areas that have definitely I've seen over the last few years have grown significantly. Um, at least at the university level, you know, if you're 
a university student and you're verified, there's no cost to join, right? You can compete. Um, you can find a team, put in a team and compete weekly um, against other universities. Obviously, as Freeman was saying, there's a barrier to that if you don't have the equipment. Um, and perhaps at a, definitely a university level, it's hit and miss on whether or not your campus has those facilities for you to go out um, and practice. But again, over the last few years, you know, we've seen um, facilities um, like down at Warwick pop up where students can go and take part and play on campus without that barrier to entry and needing that equipment. Um, I think in terms of you know, getting to that point and finding out about it, um, again, some universities really do buy into um, esports and collegiate esports and really want to push it. Others, perhaps, you've got these small uh, societies on campuses who are perhaps trying to get that recognition and be taken seriously, and there's some work to be done there. I think one thing we do have to mention that's come up today as well is how um, more open-minded people are since the pandemic for online communities, and I think that has really helped. You know, we, uh, we saw societies who would never touch video games playing Among Us um, every week um, over the pandemic, which I think has done a lot to increase the visibility of gaming as a viable source of, uh, you know, community and like social, the social aspect and everything. Um, and again, it was free for people to take part in, um, even if it wasn't at that like high competitive level. But the flip side to that um, is how insular I think online communities can be. Um, I know Discord put out all the statistics about uh, communities they've had to shut down that perhaps uh, aren't accessible or are actually um, being a little extremist and not happy, safe communities to exist in. And again, at collegiate level, at university level, there is that level of education that is needed for these um, young people to create safe communities. You know, you need moderation tools, um, you need re resources like AnyKey and things like that, um, that they're aware of and that they can use and that they understand, again, um, a common theme I've seen today is not only the education, but knowing why, um, especially, I think it was in the health seminar, like, why should I care about my vision? Um, why is this important? Um, you, if, someone's not, if someone doesn't have that lived experience of being um, a minority group or you know, having barriers to entry in competitive gaming, then they're not gonna understand the tools that people may need um, and you know, won't create safe communities. So it's kind of, Yes, it's easy to get into competitive esports, but we still need to, as the leaders in kind of um, esports and education, we need to give young students and societies and um, team leaders and coaches all of the necessary tools to make those communities safe. Because if you turn up in a Discord and you see that they're using like horrible language or it's not um, safe to be LGBT or use pronouns or whatever it is in that Discord community, then they're not going to compete. So. It's increased, but there's still work to be done, I think, on the education and making sure that these students are equipped to create those communities. Definitely. And just the f fact that there's a lot of people involved in the esports industry in the world, and there's probably a lot of people out there who are unaware of various sort of initiatives and communities or that support people from minority groups and people who may not have been able to find it as easy to get into esports, so sort of touching on not being able to afford to buy the kit, the games, and it's just all about increasing the awareness that these op options are available for people, and people can get into esports. There is a way, and whether or not it takes a year or it takes two months, it doesn't matter that there is always a way, and people will be able to find what they need to be able to get into the industry. So something I spoke to you guys about um, before this talk actually, um, was sort of touching on mental health and the sort of awareness of that and the potential limitations that can have for people sort of getting into esports. So uh, according to MIND, um, actually one in four people in the UK have a mental health condition. So t considering the size of the UK esports scene, that's quite a lot of people involved in the industry. So to all of you, do you believe that there is enough sort of support and accessibility and awareness for mental health within esports? I can, yeah, start. Um, I, think, I think it's getting there. Um, I feel like a lot of like people that play esports. So we we just went to Sweden two weeks ago for a tournament. So it was like a it was like my first LAN one. So 
you know, have to pat the PC, make sure it's safe, you need to get over there, pray it's not broken when you, when you actually arrive at the venue, and compete against other people. And what I noticed um, throughout the whole tournament was that, you know, every two minutes there was someone slamming a desk or someone screaming or happy or sad. There, there was always some sort of like emotional reaction that wasn't really warranted. Um, so I think, I mean, especially in that demographic, because a lot of it were, were boys, like 15 to 18, like Fortnite scene. Um, they don't care about anything else apart from just competing and, and just trying to win. Um, if, if you try and speak, if I try and speak to my player about, you know, oh, you should, you know, work on breathing exercises or take some time away from it and go for a walk, they'll be like, nah, like, don't want to, don't care kind of thing. So I think it's, it's difficult with, with certain demographics to like break into it and say that actually you'll probably play better if you take some time for yourself and working yourself on the sides, um, it will be beneficial towards like your your befo uh, performance going forward. So I think, uh, yeah, some, from my experience, it's been quite hard to like bridge that and to make it like a natural thing. Yeah, I would just say on that as well, obviously a lot of people use video games as a sort of escapism from the mental struggles that they maybe face on a day to day. So I think having a sense of community and people that you maybe relate to like platforms such as Discord kind of allow for that to happen. So for example, we host a community customs night every Friday within the Women in Esports Discord. And it's just a kind of place where you can go, you can meet new people, you can make new friends. Obviously with COVID being such a massive factor as well, a lot of people are spending more time online. They are making new friends and then they're getting to go to these LAN events and they're getting to meet these people as well. So I think making sure that there's a safe space for people to have this place to go to when they are feeling maybe a bit mentally challenged, I think is really, really important. Yeah. I think um, just to add to what's already been said as well is when you're going to these events, having that consideration in mind, um, I think people have gotten perhaps more aware of the pandemic of kind of the key issues um, in mental health and a, a lot more awareness and speaking about it is going around. But again, there's not a lot of education around when you get to things that aren't anxiety and depression. So there is um, more work to be done there. And again, we're the people in the room who are those leaders. And not only do we need to lead by example, and like you said, trying to get that buy-in so they understand why these things are important, um, but we also need that education and that level of understanding of what people are going through um, when it is something more complicated um, or when they do need additional um, needs at events. And again, it's, it's like a yes and no answer of, there are some events I go to and they have um, low sensory rooms you can go to. They've had a consideration for um, where people can go to kind of have a breather and, ha and have um, some time to themselves. Um, and it's about us as leaders kind of pushing for that and keep championing that and educating ourselves. Um, yeah, one thing I will say is that we got the chance to do mental health first aid training and it was amazing. Um, and I, I'd wish that I knew about that back in my university job because I think that was an amazing tool. Um, that can help a lot of students and young people. Um, so yeah, if you can be afforded um, that kind of thing in your workplace, definitely recommend undergoing that training. Um, you can do it all online and you get to learn from everything from substance abuse um, through to you know, anxiety, ADHD, autism, and all of these um, as well. So it, it covers a, a huge um, amount of information. So yeah, definitely recommend that as uh, leaders in the scene. And yeah, it's, it all links back to that sort of awareness Thing, that the more people can be aware of these things and people's needs or people's backgrounds that may be something that's affecting them in the present, that the more people can help. So to quickly round this up, um, just getting your guys' opinions here, but we've outlined some of the positive things here, but what would you like to see happen in the UK esports scene to make it more accessible to anyone from any background? Feel free to start anyone. <laughs> I would like to see more organisations being more transparent about what they're doing to improve inclusivity and diversity within their organisations. Um, obviously, in general, I would love to see that, but more so in the esports industry. Everyone's always talking about how they're making their organisation more inclusive, they're making it more diverse, but actually being transparent about that and being able to see what journey they've been on to get to that point where their organisation is inclusive and diverse, I think would be really nice for us to actually be able to see that. 
Yeah, um, I think like two things. So maybe a bit almost what you said there, but like uh, I think storytelling is quite big, and and making sure that if if you've done something that like locks into like uh, the diversity like section, you've you've done something good there. It's all well and good like posting like a graphic about it or like a tweet about it, but then if you can really get it out there, it's like, oh look, this person came from this background and they're doing this now, and it's how they did it. Um, I, I think that you know that carries its weight in, in gold. That that needs to be like focusing on and honed in on. And I think maybe the second one, like grassroots. I guess like, what all you guys are here um, trying to do and, and implement at your like schools or, or colleges. Um, just just making I think almost just like humanizing the role because even when I when when I started doing YouTube and, and content and TikTok and I was speaking to my friends and, and my mum about it, like no one got it, they didn't understand it, they didn't see it as like a viable route. Uh, you know, there's like why why won't you just go to do this course, do this safe degree and and go off and do that. Um, so I think yeah, improving the grassroots, educating the kids, the parents as well. Um, my job before XL, I worked as a teaching assistant for two years. So I've worked with kids for, for ages, like coaching before that as well. Um, so I know, just, even just from speaking to like, the parents or the kids, like they, the kids don't fully understand it. And then when they actually get into it, and, you know, oh, I want to be a professional, I want to shout cast, I want to be a streamer, like all the various different routes you can take, um, they can't articulate themselves properly. And, you know, if you're trying to win over a parent about buying a PC for a grand, you're not going to not going to win that if you not, haven't got the education there so i think yeah just making the grassroots really strong and providing like um even though like, i'm sure like the barnsley college stuff like if they can come in and see that and it's like oh like crap like they're shout casting this is professional like this is sick um it, it makes it re more real in their heads as well so yeah i think grass grassroots really important yeah. um i think perhaps echoing again what's already been said but that that representation and that kind of being able to see yourself there in the position and actually doing it. Um, I think uh, something that I struggled with was having that like self-confidence of actually this is a viable route and this is a job that you can go into. And I don't, I don't think I would be in the position I'm in now if there weren't those leaders in the industry and not just esports, but in like any professional route who said, oh, you would be really good at this kind of position. I think you should go for that. Um, I will recommend you for this. And, you know, as someone who finds networking really awkward, the fact that someone in a position of leadership would reach out to me and go, actually, I think you'd be really good at this meant a lot. Um, uh, coming from like a background of like, not being able to see yourself perhaps in a gaming industry or not seeing yourself up on a stage. Um, so yeah, be, be those people who really champion your students and what they're good at. And um, again, the storytelling that we've heard today has been really like emotionally pulling the fact that you've got people who perhaps didn't see themselves in a profession being inspired by other people's stories, I think is really, really important. So yeah, be, be that person who pushes your students or the people that you work with um, and yeah, help them build their own confidence because ultimately we're, we're all here to help each other out. So. And definitely, well, thank you very much everyone for either watching or listening today. Um, and thank you very much to my panelists. Um, so if you'd like to check out some more stuff about accessibility, we've got lots of stuff um, that I'm champion championing alongside Billy for British Esports, as well as the work that Freeman and Abby are doing at the Newell and Excel as well. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>